Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. And right now it's time for our first hot topic. Well, this one talks about why Nigeria needs decentralization. And that was being said by the Nobel laureate, Wale Shoinka. Joining me to have a conversation in this is Nick Aguli. He's a public affairs analyst. Good morning, Nick. Thank you for joining me. Good morning. And uh, good morning to all of us, our viewers globally. Yes, good morning. Okay, so um, the, our Nobel laureate, Professor Wale Shoinka, had said, you know, Nigeria needs decentralization. And he talked about things about poverty, um, hunger in the land, and that's the reason why we need decentralization. In fact, he had cited um, security matters as well. And he said, let's not talk about restructuring. We should talk more of um, reconfig reconfiguration and decentralization. First, do you agree with this statement? I will say yes and no. Okay. Walk me through yes that. No. All yes. right. So I will say yes in terms of returning pass to the subnational government. I will say no to split splitting um, or breaking up Nigeria into different pieces. And the reason why I say no is that the recent history of African nations that has splitted, the end result has been war. So I hope that the Nobel laureate understands that the problem that Nigeria is facing now is political leaders who are not empathetic of the people who take political office as a business where they can go in and grab as as much as they can within their tenures in office and after their tenures in office they want to remain in one office or the other so you will see a governor today after he has finished being a governor he will be he wants to become a senator and after that he wants to contest for president i hope the nobel laureate understands that this is the biggest problem in nigeria today Political leaders who are not empathetic with the people who think that political office is a tool to enrich themselves. If we split Nigeria under this kind of terms to say all the six geopolitical zones go your separate ways and the political leaders are, that are going to those geopolitical zones are the same political leaders that are superintending over Nigeria now. Nothing is going to change. Nothing. Mm -hmm. I can assure the Nobel laureate that nothing will change. So if, for instance, the Southeast today becomes a country of its own, and the governors of the Southeast are the governors that we have today in the Southeast who are not delivering good governance, but uh, filling their pockets. And uh, the governors in the North Central are doing the same. Same with governors in the Southwest, South, South, North East, North Central. What's going to change? Nothing is going to change. So what the Nobel laureate must be advocating for is leadership recruitment. We need to get leadership recruitment right. In this same country, we have competent, compassionate leaders with capacity to do the job. The problem is that we are not putting them in office. And so the people who end up putting in office are not the ones who are going to do the job. So on that account, that would be my, my input in what the Nobel laureate has said. Mm. On, the, on the account of uh, releasing power to the subnational government, I agree with him. The, the, I keep saying this thing, that we call ourselves, our official name is the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And we are not operating a federation. We are actually operating a unitary system of government. So we call ourselves a federal republic and we are practicing unitary system of government because you see, <clears throat> we have a constitution where about 68 or so items on that constitution are exclusively reserved to the federal government. Sort of federation is that. Like the United States where we, we copy the democracy from, we know what the states can do. The states are in charge of their economies, they're in charge of their police, they're in charge of their, in fact, the states in America send money to the center 
not the other way around in Nigeria where the federal government sends money to the states and local governments. So you can see the anomaly there. Yeah. So on that count, I agree totally with the Nobel already. Our constitution, in fact, you see, we don't have a constitution. The constitution begins with the words, we, the people of Nigeria, haven't agreed to come together as one nation, blah, blah, blah. Please, this constitution that we are operating now, when did the people of Nigeria come together mm. to make this constitution? This constitution was handed down to us by the military uh, rulers. And those military rulers, both uh, General Babangida and General Abacha, they were intent on, uh, we used to call it then, transmuting yeah. from Kaki to Agbada. So even as they wanted to wear Agbada, they didn't want to release power to anybody. They wanted to hold on to maximum power, just like they were when they were in Kaki. And that is the constitution that tragically we have operated for 25 years. So if we really want to get it right, we need to bring this constitution and actually fashion a constitution that will reflect us as a federal republic, a constitution where the local government will be empowered, the states will be empowered, and the federal government will only be dealing with about six items, which will be defense, foreign policy, uh, monetary policy, uh, and, uh, and uh, issuance of currency, issuance of passport, like that. That should only be the role of the federal government. Every other thing should be at the state. And in that case, you will not see development coming up because it's not all states that are going to be this bad as we have a federal government. Because right now, if you have a president who is not delivering, the whole Nigeria will not deliver because powers are rested in that president. But if you have 36 state governors, with so much powers to develop their states. Perhaps, maybe about 20 of them can be delivering the goods. Uh, if the other 16 are not, but Nigeria will actually be a better place. So uh, that's why I say uh, yes or no in my, in my uh, response to what the Nobel already said. Yeah. So a lot of people have you know, always cited the fact that there is so much power in the center and that the only way we can start to grow is to ensure the um, we decentralize that power that is in the center. And from what you've said, you said yes mm -hmm. and no. Mm -hmm. But now, so let's just say, okay, for instance, we have this decentralization. How can we start to benefit from it? Because decentralization is one thing, but are we going to benefit from it? So is there going to be more um, investors coming in for um, maybe the local investment of the state? Um, is there also going to be maybe, for instance, a state police that we've been talking about for a while, because that's also some form of decentralization um, of power from the IGP of police. So it's not just in the center. Is there going to be that? What other benefits can we start to see if we go ahead to implement this decentralization? Benefits are going to be humongous. Mm. If we actually get a people-oriented constitution that devotes power as to the subnational governments, the state and local governments, the benefits are going to be humongous. Let me give you one example. Let's say security. Yeah. Today, we call the state governors the chief security officers of their states. But mm. no commander, no single commander in that state reports to the governor. The commissioner of police reports to the IG, who reports to the president. The commander of the civil defense reports to the commandant of civil defense, who reports to the president. The commander of the DSS in that state reports to the DG of DSS, who reports to the president. Mm. All the security architecture in the state, they report to the federal. Yet we are calling the governor a, a chief security officer of his state. If we decentralize power and the states are now responsible for their security, you will now see that some state governors, even if it's not all of them, some state governors are going to invest heavily in security, get their police to work, both in terms of crime prevention and crime uh, control, if a crime happens. And for those states, you begin to see a flood of investment coming to the state because people will feel safe going to those states. Mm. Right now, we have a single inspector general of police if that inspector general of police is incompetent, 
is not effective, has no capacity, the entire 36 states and the FCT of the Nigerian police will be incompetent with that capacity. Because one man sitting in Abuja, who is their leader, is incompetent. But if you have 36 state commissioners of police and the FCT, all of them reporting to their governors, you will see that some of them, if not most of them, are going to be doing the work of keeping their state safe. And that would then mean that parts of Nigeria will become much safer than what we have today. Let me give you an example. When states are being fed by the federal government, as it is happening today, you will expect that they will be lazy. Because even me, who is sitting here, if my father, even now that he's not alive, he has set up an endowment where every month I get like 5 to 10 million naira into my account. Do you think I will work? Mm -hmm. Will I work now? Why will I work? Mm. When a uh, 10 million naira alert is going to come every month, I will just be cruising. <laughs> but if you allow states to generate their revenue and spend it, look, <laughs> you, you will discover that every state will now start looking inwards. What do I have? If you go to the United States, you know, uh, we, we heard the news, the tragic uh, news of the, of the, of the chopper crash of, uh, that, that had on board the, the access, uh, CEO of the access holdings. You know where they were going? They were going to, um, to Las Vegas, you know? Do you know what happens in Las Vegas? La La Las Vegas is in a state called Nevada mm. in the U.S. Do you, do you know about this state? This state, for the benefit of our viewers who don't know, is desert land. The state is totally desert. The Nevada desert covers the state. So this state has no land, nothing, nothing to try and survive. You know what they did? Because there is no big papa at the federal government to send them money. They decided to develop tourism. And that is why you can go and make your money in the other states. Then you bring it to Las Vegas and spend it. And that money, so, so like you take $10,000 into Las Vegas, you will leave that money in Las Vegas and carry yourself and go back to wherever you're coming from. And that is how they are surviving. This is the kind of ingenuity that will come, even in states here in Nigeria. But once you leave them to their, to their distance, like I'm in Benue State here, yeah? you know that no governor of Benue State in the past 25 years has given attention to agriculture. Mm. As I speak today, and it's the food basket of the nation. Level. Yes, let me tell you that that full basket is empty. <laughs> that full basket basket is empty for twin problems. Wow. The first problem is that the farmers are using manual labor. Mm. And manual labor is not going to produce much. But even with the manual labor, a large swatch of farming communities have been driven away by insecurity from their farming communities. And the state governor has no police of his to send to go and clear the bandits yeah. to allow the farmers to work. If you decentralize power now and say that, Mr. Governor, you are in charge of your security. Of course, you know, the state governor is going to invest in security to ensure that his state is safe. Yeah. And Mr. Governor will suddenly see the fertile land in his state and start investing in it so that he will start making money from the agriculture that will now be booming. Because he knows that there will be no money coming from the center. And if he doesn't uh, take creative measures to survive, he will be dead. So this is the reason why that decentralization is going to be very good. But for. when this happens, right, with what you've just cited, couldn't it be that some states will start to flourish, you know, even more than the others? How about, you know, states that cannot do so much, you know, agriculture or look for other things? I, I just don't want a situation whereby there's envy and rivalry between different states because they, they're not playing on the same um, um, field. It's absolutely fine. Mm. It is better that in Nigeria we have some states that are doing better than others than to have a, a Nigeria totally that is not doing well. Mm. So in terms of holistic numbers, for us it's better that out of 36 states we have 20 doing well and 16 are not doing well instead of 36 that are not doing well now. Mm. So that is the kind of thing that will happen. But so once you decentralize and some states begin to do well, indigenous of the states that are not doing well we start putting pressure on their political leaders mm. like say if benue now industrializes agriculture and benue is now producing a lot of food their farmers are becoming millionaires and billionaires and nasarawa state the neighboring state or taraba is not doing same with their uh, rich fertile arable land 
you know that the the the, 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 the indigenous in those states will be putting pressure on their leaders. He said, why can't you see what's happening in Benue and then you leave us in poverty? That is what we need. We need citizens to put pressure on the elected representatives and leaders at all levels for us to enjoy this democracy. Okay. But walk me through, um, you know, with every implementation, right, there's always the people who would actually have that pushback and say, oh, no, this is not what we want. This is not what we need. For instance, a lot of people have been talking about a parliamentary system of government instead of the presidential system of government. And you hear people say, oh, no, that's not what we need. We like where we are. A lot of times people are scared to, um, scared to make any change in particular. So do you walk me through the potential challenges that could be with this? I mean, we're saying we need to decentralize, but are there potential challenges that we could possibly face when it comes to decentralization? So for me, um, when people talk about parliamentary system and the presidential system that we're running, I try to make the analogy that MS these bands and a BMW, mm. they are both good cars and they are serving those that buy them. Yeah. But if you have a bad driver, mm. then it's regardless of which car you give him. If you give him a Mercedes Benz, he will crash it. Right. If you give him a, a BMW, he will crash it. That's right. You know, so <laughs> this thing is more about the people operating the system. This same presidential system that doesn't seem to be working well for us, it's working well for the, the United States. And this is where we actually want to copy it. The parliamentary system is also working in places like uh, the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, and all of that. Do you understand? Yeah. So it's not really about the system. It's about the operators of the system. So if Nigeria today switches from the presidential system to the parliamentary system, and we still have political leaders, who don't understand their role as servants of the people, but rather they see themselves are using their political offices to corruptly enrich themselves. They will still corrupt the parliamentary system that we have. So that is one thing. That's the first thing. But if we now handle the operators, let's say we have competent operators now, we are taking care of that. I will always say the parliamentary system is a better system of government. Why? Because it's cheaper, is more representative and in the parliamentary system is where both the legislative arm of government and the executive arm of government are together so that foster as uh, government policy makes it uh, more seamless to operate and all of that uh, in a parliamentary system you don't actually have a presidential election you don't have yeah. a presidential election you know the prime minister of the uk didn't go about asking for voters to vote him as prime minister mm -hmm. he only went to his own constituency and sought the votes of his constituents who voted him to parliament. But because, because he is the leader of the party that has the majority of MPs in parliament, he automatically becomes prime minister. You know, and every week on a Wednesday, he's on the on the soapbox, he's uh, facing the opposition party. And you know, uh, imagine in uh, Nigeria now, every week, um, President Tinubu is on one side. Atiku Abubakar, who came second mm. in the election, is on the other side. And they are facing each other. You know, Atiku Abubakar is challenging President Tinubu on his policies. And President Tinubu will feel so much under pressure. Yeah. The kind of things he will say, like his statement uh, yesterday when he was commissioning uh, the, red the Lagos Red Line, mm -hmm. where he now said uh, Labor Union have not given him time that in nine months. Uh, Atiku Abubakar will run into him. We try to tear him apart, appealing to Nigeria to see a president who is insensitive, who is uh, uh, unsympathetic with mm. their plight. So that is parliamentary system. And also in the parliamentary system, Atiku Abubakar, as the opposition leader, will also be a government employee. Mm. He will be provided with offices, he will be provided with everything that is needed to run his government as an opposition leader. So if President Tindibu has a minister for education, Atiku Abubakar will have a shadow Minister for Education, who is also being paid by government, of course, who is also an MP, having been elected to parliament. Mm. So if Atiko Abubakar's Minister of Finance comes to, uh, sorry, if President Tinubu's Minister of Finance comes to make a policy statement, Atiko Abubakar's shadow Minister of Finance, mm. we hold his own press conference yeah. and we give Nigerians the alternative view 
you know so that that's the parliamentary system is actually all right let me take let me take your final words on this whole decentralization okay so i wanted to take your final words because we have to wrap it up now so i want to take your final words on this whole decentralization um you had earlier said yes and no but ha after having this conversation what do you think we should do as a nation moving forward so my final words is that our name the federal republic of nigeria is not backed up by our constitution yeah we have a name federal republic of nigeria our constitution is you Republic of Nigeria. The <laughs> area we take steps to sink our name and our constitution, the better. So we either have to agree that we change our name to the Fed, to the uh, to the unitary Republic of Nigeria to align with the constitution, or we change the constitution to a true federal system. A true federal system. Well, there's a, a there's, there's there's a restructuring. So this imbalance they're looking that we have, at. Sorry, yeah. um, excuse me. They are looking at, you know, just restructuring the constitution and they said that should be ready in 2025. So that might just possibly happen. They, they, they see what they are doing with the constitution. They are doing patching. They are patching the constitution here and there. What we need to do is that we just need to be in this constitution and have a truly federal constitution. Right. You know, some people call, say, well, let's have a constituent assembly, national sovereign conference. The national assembly as currently constituted can also do it because they are representing all of us in Nigeria. This constitution they are patching here and there. We have been patching it for the past 25 years. It's not done the job. Well, we just need to have a federal time to have constitution, a, new one. a constitution that hands powers to the subnational government. All right. Thank you so much. It was so nice um, having a conversation with you, Nika Gule. Thank you. Thank you and uh, have a nice day. You too, sir. Thank you. All right, so we've been speaking with Nick Aguli, he's a public affairs analyst, and we'll be talking about decentralization because um, our Nobel laureate, Professor Wally Showing, has said Nigeria needs decentralization. Anyways, we'll go on a short break. When we return, we'll be looking at our next hot topic. Please stay with us.